Hello. This lecture, we're going to look at an early episode uh, in the Federal Union, 1789, 1790, that sort of highlights the early divisions of political parties, shows the early role of sectionalism, uh, discusses some of our early national leaders, also kind of outlines one of our more interesting and I think important national uh, financial policies, and one I think that is still relevant today. And this topic we're going to talk about is something, uh, it was a controversial topic called funding and assumption. Funding and assumption. And it had to do with debt, the national and the state debt. And in order to talk about that, first we have to talk about one of the political leaders, and that's Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. You know, Hamilton, 1789, Washington appoints him Secretary of the Treasury. He's one of Washington's early appointments. He's a close affiliate with Washington, uh, one of the main Federalist promoters of the Constitution. Hamilton's an interesting guy. He's from the West Indies, right? He doesn't really have any loyalty to any one state. He calls New York City his home. He kind of hates regionalism and statism. He's very into making this early national project very strong, promoting federalism. It really appealed to him intellectually and financially. Unlike many of the other early leaders, even in this early national period, you know, Hamilton has pretty weak revolutionary c credentials. You know, he doesn't really uh, join up with Washington until pretty late in the revolution. He's one of his aides de camp, kind of a secretary to Washington. He has a, a real desire to, to, to reestablish America's political and economic connections to Great Britain, to England. And this is for very both pragmatic and personal reasons. You know, one personally, ideologically, he really looks up to Great Britain's, their style of government in terms of having this very dynamic uh, financial sector that works with the government, has powerful taxation, is able to build a mighty navy and manage a, a great empire, is done from what he sees as a very logical and pragmatic financial union between the government and business and manufacturing and finance. And he wants that for the new nation. Also, he realizes that America needs to jumpstart its export economy again. And reacquainting and re-engaging with England is the key to that. Also, you know, among early national leaders, in some ways, Hamilton is, I think it's fair to say, the least idealistic, at least from a revolutionary standpoint, you know. Uh, Hamilton thought most people were actually motivated by self-interest and not virtue. He, he's somewhat cynical and his policies often will reflect that belief, like that he felt that if he could tie the uh, monetary self-interests of the dynamic elite and the upwardly mobile wealthy to the success of the government, he could tie those interests together, that would make the government more successful, right? That is the key. He's sort of this sort of uh, kind of a capitalist Republican, right? That he feels that people's market interests is what needs to be tied to the government. And that, when you link that private interest with public interests, the country will grow and it will grow stronger. And he felt that England had pretty much already done that. That's the model he's working with. One of the first things he's asked to do by Congress is to review the debt of the nation, public debt. You know, after fighting a revolution and after the Articles of Confederation, one of the big problems in America is debt, right? We are in debt. We've been living on borrowed time and borrowed money for a long period of, of time now. And assessing what the debt is and figuring out how best to address it, that falls to Alexander Hamilton. And he puts forth uh, this thing called a report on, on public credit to the Congress. And in it, he does a couple of things. One, he outlines what is the debt, right? He looks at the debt and he says uh, it falls into a couple of categories. First, there's foreign debt, right? And that's the debt that we owe to foreign nations, basically nations, particularly France, who had, who had given us arms and munitions, 
uh, during the revolution, right? That we do have a debt to these nations, people who had invested in early America. And, you know, that amounted to about $11 million. And, you know, that's what we owe to foreign governments. And then he saw there was domestic debt. And domestic debt fell into two categories. There was uh, national debt and state debt. You know, the national debt was money that the national government owed to other people, right? One of the big things is, you know, the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation, right, had basically, with IOUs, you know, used a lot of farms and supplies and munitions uh, and back pay for soldiers, all these things during the revolution, right? We didn't have any money, so a lot of that was done on loan, and that's a debt we still owe. Another big thing they owe are war bonds, right? So what is a war bond? It's, it's the same then as now, but in order to raise money for the war, the Continental Congress and, and the Articles of Confederation sold bonds, where individuals, you know, you would buy a bond for, these are just using examples, for $10, and, you know, in 10 years it would be, be mature and worth $20, right? So it's putting upfront money now, making a loan to the government so they could be solvent and manage this war effort. And so there was a lot of money owed in these war bonds, right? So to individual businesses that had lent money and stuff domestically to the revolution, war bonds, and back pay for soldiers actually still mattered. The total amount to that was, you know, roughly $27 million. And Hamilton took it upon himself to also look at what the states owed. Because many states during the revolution had sold war bonds owed back pay to soldiers, and also had borrowed from the populace in order to support the war effort. So there's, there's these bonds and stuff out there. And he found that the states collectively owed around another $25 million. All right, so you have this state debt, you have this national debt, and we have this foreign debt. You know, Hamilton in his report on public credit outlines what this debt is and sort of stipulates that, that Congress passed these solutions. First solution was listen, we have to pay the foreign debt in full, right? It's $11 million. There was a lot of people talking about maybe we should scale down the debt, you know, pay only a certain percentage of it back. And uh, Hamilton says that's suicide. He says, number one thing, because why do you ever care about debt? Why is it important for individuals or governments or companies or anyone to know about debt? What do you want to know? What do you gain by paying back debt? Well, quite simply, you get credit, right? That's the big connection. You pay off your debts, you get credit. Our young nation is desperate for credit. Our businesses, our growth, everything relies on having good credit, right? Very few institutions or nations or people have all the money they need on hand, right, right at that moment. Credit is, is the way of modern economics, and, and Hamilton understood that. And so that he really wants to, says, you know, America can't be wealthy right away. We won't be big producers with a high GDP, but we can get good credit early on and grow you know, through, through good expenditures. And foreign debt, foreign sources of money, right, are, are the first thing he targets is we have to pay that off in full. And you know, this passes through Congress. Congress says, yeah, we actually agree with that idea. In fact, the early Congress overwhelmingly votes to pay off the foreign debt in full. The second part, though, had to do with this national debt and the state debt. He felt what, what Hamilton wanted was not only should we pay off this national domestic debt that we owe, but he wanted us to assume, so this idea of funding and assumption, the federal government should take over these state debts, that the state debts should be taken over by the government because the federal government would be more able to pay them off, right? And that this would be all collapsed into one big debt, some $52 million, that the federal government would assume responsibility for and would provide funding towards that debt repayment. Now, he does this um, for a couple of reasons, right? One, he wants to exercise federal power over the states from the very beginning. He also wants to tie those who owe money and their future interests, again, this idea of self-interest, to the success of the new national government. He runs into a couple of problems, right? James Madison, who had been an ally of his uh, during the ratification, one of the fellow Federalists of the Constitution, turns against him 
Madison, a staunch Virginian, had become more and more in the sphere of Thomas Jefferson, right? These sort of these early political alignments. And as I said, Jefferson liked to remain aloof and behind the scenes. And he had a guy like Madison, who was an excellent speaker and a hard worker and a crafty politician as sort of his bulldog who would lead his public fights in Congress. And, and Madison is Speaker of the House at this time. And there's a couple of problems, right? One, there's this sort of fear of the federal government taking over debts, right? That that's too much power and finances to concentrate in one hand. These sort of anti-federalists are becoming more hardened in their political views. They're, they're nervous about the concentration of money and funding, right? In a federal government away from state governments. Also, the southern states had paid off their debts, particularly places like Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Maryland had actually managed their debts pretty well. They had successfully paid them off these domestic debts during the early national period, during the Articles of Confederation. In fact, it's these northern states, particularly Connecticut and Massachusetts, that hold all this bad debt. Um, and so there's this sort of sectionalist idea, this inability of people in Virginia to kind of jump on board, even though they've ratified the Constitution with nationalist thinking. The idea is, why should we be providing you know, funds and taxation right, towards paying off mismanaged debts of the northern states. And of course, that's very much at the heart of what a federal government would do, right? Where you would take, you know, funds from all of the states in order to, you know, help out states who had bad debts to bring us all up together, right? This is a very early contention between federalism and states' rights and, and a sectionalist idea. They also kind of knew something else that Hamilton was about, you know? We have to think about who held a lot of this debt. Back pay to soldiers is one thing, and, and IOUs to private business is another. But most of this state debt was in the form of war bonds. And what happened with these bonds was this, that during the chaos of the Articles of Confederation, a lot of people who held these bonds, right, so if you bought a bond for $10 and you know, you're hoping someday it would mature to $20, well, the point was they were losing complete faith in the government. And they were under the belief that, boy, this bond is worthless. And these sort of sharp-minded speculators and financial institutions went out and aggressively bought the bonds. They would go up to the small farmer who holds this bond and says, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a dollar, you know, to take that $10 bond off your hand, right? So you get something instead of nothing. You'll just have to eat the loss. And many, many people sold. In fact, you know, most of these bonds are actually held by small groups of, of financial speculators. And both people like Madison know that, and Hamilton knows that. And Hamilton very much wanted to tie the interests of those speculators, because why would a speculator do this? Well, if I now have the bond, I'm hoping that someday the government will remain solvent and pay me the full $20 that this $10 bond that I bought for $1, you know, is worth. I mean, that's a pretty big um, profit. And Hamilton loves people who think that way. To him, he says, yes, that group of people, they are the ambitious, modern, financially savvy risk takers. They're the new money. They're the, um, you know, like I said, the sort of more visionary financial interests I want to tie their interests to the success of this government. And in fact, by assuming the state debts in a very real way, you tie their interests in, right? Because if the federal government buys these state debts, the guys, these speculators who want to get paid off will have to support the federal government. They'll have to put their energy, their political influence, their social economic influence behind the success of federalism. The federal government, if they want these bonds paid off in full, and that's very much the sort of thing that Hamilton wants. It's really why he wants to assume this state debt. He wants to make it an exercise in federalism over states' rights, and he wants to tie this sort of new dynamic money interest to the success of the government. Though, as I said, Congress agrees to pay the foreign uh, debt in full, Madison leads this whole thing where he's saying he's willing to fund the national domestic debt but not to assume the state debts. 
And he leads a huge battle. He's quite skillful, and it actually deadlocks the Congress. And early on, there's this big battle. We see this early hardening. Now, they're not quite political parties left yet. But on the one side, you have this sort of Hamiltonians or the Federalists who want funding of all the debt and assumption of state debts, this sort of expansion of federal power, this sort of new vision of this link between uh, investment and government influence. And on the other hand, this sort of more sectionally driven Jeffersonians or Madisonians who will become the Republicans, right, who are willing to fund the national debt but don't feel that people in Virginia should pay for badly managed debts in Massachusetts and more importantly don't want the government to link up with these new moneyed interests, right? So they want funding of the national debt without assumption of the state debt. And this really deadlocks. You know, this is one of the first really contentious flaps in this new national Congress. And in fact, there's a story that used to be told is factual, and now most historians think that it's mostly apocryphal, although there's some truth to it. And the story runs something like this. The Capitol at this time is in New York City. And George Washington has a home in New York City. And, and one night, Thomas Jefferson is leaving Washington's home after dinner, and Hamilton's been waiting for him outside. And whether or not this is true, I hope it's true, because it's a wonderful image. And Hamilton basically accosts him and confronts him and says, listen, I know you're the one who's behind the opposition to funding and assumption. And I know that you understand how important this is for our early government to bring all this under one roof, to break this deadlock, to act in concert, right? This actually really is good for the country. You have to break this deadlock. I know you're the one who can do it, Jefferson. You have to do it. And whether or not that actual vignette actually happened, what does happen is a meeting is held in Washington's house shortly thereafter. And Hamilton's invited there and he arrives and Jefferson and Madison are both sitting there and they basically strike a deal. And the deal is this, that Jefferson and Madison will guarantee that funding and assumption will pass together if they'll move and Hamilton and his allies will agree to move the capital of the United States. First to Philadelphia for 10 years while they build a new capital in Northern Virginia, which becomes Washington, D.C., right? They have to agree to move the capital. That's all Jefferson and Madison want. They want him to move the capital. Hamilton agrees to this, right? And actually, uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut sweetens the deal a little bit, where he makes this part of the bill that these southern states uh, get some, uh, actually are given extra funding, extra grants as a reward for having done a good job of managing their state debt during the early national period. And all of that comes off. And in fact, from a financial side, this is a great success. Uh, you know, the American debt actually uh, swells. It goes up to about 80 million because we begin selling more war bonds. Over 80% of our initial federal budget for the first 10 years is dedicated solely towards debt repayment. And by 1800, we've paid off this initial debt. This is an amazing thing. We actually pay it off. And from the most early states, from the early 1790s, America gets sterling, sterling credit, both in international markets and among the wealthy and the dynamically financially elite in America, believe in the solvency and the credibility of the American government. Hamilton gets what he wants. In fact, these financial arrangements, more so than anything else, because we don't really have very broad-based taxation, um, make the early American solvent and dynamic, right? It's all about credit. And America will maintain that credit for a very long period of time, you know, up until very recent times when, once again, debt spending and, and, and deficit has gotten so large where American credit is once again jeopardized. And you don't have to even have a degree in finance or economics to understand why that's a dangerous situation, right? That credit means everything, even to a wealthy nation. Yes, it meant the world to a new post-colonial nation, and it is a message to post-colonial nations across the third world today about the value of responsibly managing debt. But even for very wealthy nations, we need credit. You never have enough cash on hand to really cover all the things a nation does. But managing debt is at the heart of credit. That's part of the visionary part of Hamilton. 
That's the visionary part of this story. But underneath this story is the non-visionary part, the sinister storyline. It's in a proto level. And I want you to look at it like this. Two of our most enlightened leaders, and these are really two of our most educated and enlightened leaders, Jefferson and Madison, hold up good legislation and resolve that legislation with a deal. And the deal is as small-minded and sectionalist as it could possibly be. What's the deal? What does Jefferson get out of this? Right? He doesn't really do anything for states' rights. They move the capital closer to where he lives. Part of it's personal. He's spiting, spites Hamilton, because Hamilton lives in New York. Right? He wants to spite Hamilton. I don't think Hamilton cared, because I don't think he had any loyalty to any region. But in Jefferson's mind, sectionalism being almost everything, he does it out of spite. And really, they were willing to um, hold up significant and important early national legislation and finances over sectionalism. The way Jefferson and Madison are rewarded, they move the capital closer to Virginia, basically in Virginia, right? As sort of a saying, Virginians get the capital. That's what we agree to even though D.C. is cordoned off as a, as a distinct and separate area. That's very, it's, you know, it's right there at the mouth of Potomac into the Chesapeake is where it's moved. This isn't quite the same thing as going to war over slavery, but we see those deep-seated roots where I said, even a truly enlightened global thinker, man of the Enlightenment like Jefferson can be as trapped in sectionalism at these key and critical moments is a harbinger for future troubles that we'll have down the load is these sectional um, cultural attributes will harden into real partisan identities, real regional identities. By the 1830s, we'll begin the real divisions and true challenge to our federal union. And in the early 1860s, we'll erupt in this incredibly destructive civil war, right? That almost tears the union down, creates our most destructive period. It's all there at the very beginning. These first alignments of political parties, Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians, Federalists, states' rightists, and that dark seed of sectionalism is there as well. Why also at the same time fairly high-minded modernism, nationalism about debt management and national credit. Real vision. It's all swirling there at the same moment. And that's why I sort of shared this one little story with you that sort of highlights all three things, uh, all the things that that Washington worried about in his farewell address, and you know these political, cultural, and economic attributes that would con continue to cause conflict, division, as well as po progress all throughout early America into modern American times. Thank you.